As a kid, I was always fascinated with history. I read about it, I watched documentaries, but now I want to visit and walk the ground of those historic places that I've spent years studying. Join me on my trek, History Adventures. Today on History Adventures, we're going to visit Pearl Harbor and a few of the bases on the island of Oahu. This video is from my documentary, Pearl Harbor, The Real Story, from 2001, when I was granted permission to walk around several of the bases. You can find the full documentary on Amazon Prime with a link in the description. There's been a lot of changes at Pearl Harbor since 2001, but this still is a great tour of the military bases. Pearl Harbor as it looks today. The Pacific is of major importance to the United States Navy and Pearl Harbor is still an active naval base. Since 1941, many things have changed here, but many things still remain the same. Battleship Row, December 7th, 1941. And Battleship Row as it looks today, with the USS Arizona Memorial and the USS Missouri now on display. Fort Island is no longer used as a landing strip, but many of the historic buildings still remain. Flying over Battleship Row, you can still get an idea of what it looked like to the Japanese. Hangar number six was torn down many years ago and replaced with new naval training buildings. The seaplane ramp at the south end of Ford Island. Hangar six was located in this area. The battleship USS California was tied up to these keys. Motor launches used this landing on Ford Island during the attack. The 1010 dock. Monuments and markers are located around Ford Island to commemorate the attack. Hospital Point, now known as Nevada Point. The USS Nevada in her attempt to escape the harbor ran aground in this area. A marker memorializes the men of the USS Nevada. The Ford Island Dispensary, then and now. The USS Arizona was moored to the Keys just off the shores of Ford Island. She remains in the harbor a memorial to all the sacrifices of December 7th. Well, I think part of the fascination of visiting the USS Arizona Memorial is the history behind the Pearl Harbor attack. Many of our visitors are really unaware of that uh, history. They know that this is a so-called tourist attraction. And one of the things that we try to do is really take them out of that mode and make them understand that it really isn't a tourist attraction, but rather a place of death and remembrance and sacrifice. And it truly is a place where the world comes to remember and America still comes to mourn. The USS Arizona Memorial was constructed in 1960-61 and dedicated on Memorial Day 1962. The memorial itself spans the wreck of the Arizona and doesn't touch it. It's really suspended above it by 36 piers. The memorial is made of materials of steel, girder, and uh, concrete. It was designed by Mr. Alfred Price, a local architect here, who believed that the memorial should be a place of reflection and, and, uh, and somberness and, and silence. His architecture reflects that. The memorial itself uh, has been placed really in three categories. As you walk up the stairs going in the memorial, the first place you go into is the entry room. On either side of you are the flags of our country, in particular on the left side are the flags of, our, of the, all the armed services uh, here in Hawaii on, at the time of December 7, 1941 in the national colors. 
On the right-hand side are the flags of the states of all the battleships here, including the auxiliary gunnery ship, former battleship Utah. As you continue out of that room, you go into the main assembly area. There are wayside exhibits on either end that describe the ship and its state uh, today. In other words, you get to see the ship as she was in 1941 and as she is today as an archaeological site. Oil leaks up from the sides of the ship and you can literally peer off either side of the opening windows and look down on the ship itself. On the right-hand side of the memorial, you'd be looking at barbette number three in which gun turret three sat on top of. Occasionally you can see portions of the ship sticking out of the water depending on the uh, tide. And that is looking towards the aft uh, section of the vessel where gun turrets three and four were. On the left hand side as you look over you will see the galley area of the ship going up towards the bow. Uh, there's portions of the smokestack ring that can be seen. You can see actually the ovens that were made up part of the galley. So the most visible portion of the ship is right off of that right hand side. You can see the fair leads of, and bits that secured the ship to the mooring quays, which are, there are two mooring quays that are on either side of the memorial in which the USS Arizona was tied to on the morning of December 7th. And lastly, when you go into the final room is the shrine room in which a wall of marble, Vermont marble, confronts you with all of the names of the Arizona dead, 1,177 names of sailors, officers and marines that lost their life. They represent the greatest loss of life of, of uh, Navy personnel in their history. So it is a special place. The USS Arizona as she is today. As you can see, wiring harnesses are visible just inside the entrance. As we swim over the ship, debris still litters its deck. Oil on the ceiling of an interior compartment. An open hatch allows you to view deep inside the ship. Turret number one with 14 inch guns. The Arizona had four sets of three 14-inch guns. Nine of the guns were salvaged from the ship. After 60 years, oil still seeps from the ship. The teakwood deck is now covered with silt. A hatch used by sailors over 60 years ago leaving the USS Arizona 60 years after the attack.
The USS Utah Memorial is located on the west side of Ford Island. Early in 1970, talk began by shipmates and supporters of the USS Utah that a memorial should be built to honor the dead. Fifty-eight sailors and officers gave their lives on December 7, 1941, when the Utah was attacked. On May 27, 1972, Senator Moss of Utah dedicated the memorial. The Utah and her crew were an instrumental part of the struggle in the Pacific. The training that the Utah had provided to the pilots, warships, subs, and anti-aircraft gunners made the Pacific Fleet a well-trained force early on in World War II. The Utah's advanced remote control systems provided training of combat situations and was a key part in preparing the Pacific Fleet for war. The memorial is a 40 by 15 foot concrete platform connected to the northwest shore of Ford Island by a 70 foot walkway. The site of the memorial is a beautiful and tranquil resting place. A naval color guard continues to raise the flag each morning at the memorial to honor the sailors that are entombed. Due to military restrictions on Ford Island, few have the opportunity to visit the USS Utah Memorial. The memorial truly is a place to honor and pay respect to the men of the USS Utah. The USS Utah as she sits on the harbor floor. Swimming along the starboard side, you see portholes. Twisted and wrecked metal covers areas of the ship. One of the Utah guns covered with sea growth. A ladder that once led to the deck. The porthole left open 60 years ago, now the interior is full of silt. Bubbles escape from the hull. After 60 years, the ship still leaks oil. Salvage cables still drape over the hull of the USS Utah. The National Park Service USS Arizona Memorial Visitor Center the Visitor Center was opened in 1980 and has had millions of visitors from all over the world. The Visitor Center is the starting point for visitors wanting to make the trip out to the USS Arizona Memorial.
The Visitor Center Museum has many artifacts from the USS Arizona and from the attack on December 7, 1941. The museum is an open-air museum and future plans are to expand and develop more exhibits to increase the number of artifacts on display. Models show you how the ships looked before and after the attack. The museum also has many Japanese artifacts. Exterior displays line the walkways around the visitor center, memorials to all that were involved in the attack. The USS Bofin Submarine Museum is also located at Pearl Harbor. Today the Bofin is one of only a few World War II submarines still in existence. Take a walk through the sub and imagine what it must have been like to be on board a submarine during World War II. The Bofin Museum covers the history of submarines. Eva Field is now abandoned. A memorial remembers the Marines killed on December 7, 1941. A golf course now covers part of the abandoned airstrip. Haleiwa has been abandoned for many years. I'm First Lieutenant Angela Judge. I'm the base media officer for Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Um, construction for Naval Air Station Kanyoi Bay actually began in 1939, and the base was commissioned in February 1941. Ten months later, of course, when the Japanese attacked the military installations in Hawaii, Naval Air Station Kanyoi Bay was one of them. Seldom is it told that it is believed that we were the first installation in Hawaii to be attacked. Since 1941, the bases went through a lot of changes. In 1949, the Navy decommissioned Naval Air Station Kaneohe Bay and the base went into a caretaker status for two and a half years. 1951, the Marine Corps decided the Idle Airfield would make an excellent home for a combined air ground team. And then 1952, Marine Corps Air Station Kaneohe Bay was commissioned. The 2,951 acres of the Makapa Peninsula later served as the home for the 1st Marine Expeditionary Brigade until the brigade deactivated, which was in 1994, though many of the assets here remained aboard the base. In 1999, the Commander Patrol Reconnaissance Forces, U.S. Pacific Fleet, brought its patrol squadrons back to Marine Corps Base Hawaii, Kaneohe Bay, where they actually began in 1941. Along with them came a Navy helicopter squadron as well. Today at Marine Corps Base Hawaii, we have aviation and ground assets as well as um, support, combat service support elements here. Marine Corps Base Hawaii is strategically located in the Pacific to best support Commander-in-Chief Pacific Command and his staff in operations and exercises. Um, first, we're the only base with deployable combat forces on U.S. soil west of California, and our secure mid-Pacific location prov provides an excellent environment to conduct operational maneuver from the sea in the Pacific. And as it did during Desert Shield and Desert Storm, our 7,700-foot runway is capable of launching large aircraft like the C-5 Galaxy as well as commercial airliners. So we're strategically located in the Pacific. 
Bellows Field is now abandoned as an airstrip, but is still in use as an r, &R post for military families. Monuments are located on the base to memorialize the pilots killed and the capturing of a Japanese mini-sub just off of this beach. A mock-up of a P-40 sits near the front gate of Wheeler Field. Flying over the field today, it still looks very similar to the way it did on the morning of December 7, 1941. Today's Army pilots fly state-of-the-art helicopters. The hangars look much as they did in 1941 and are still in use today for the base's helicopters. Inside the hangars, damage remains from the attack, and just outside, cement patches cover bomb craters in the flight line. Historic reminders of the attack on December 7, 1941. This is the Schofield Barracks Army Museum, also known as the Tropic Lightning Museum. We have displays ranging from the early days of Schofield Barracks when it was established in 1907 all the way to the 1930s and, and of course to Pearl Harbor. The other part of our museum deals with the history of the 25th Infantry Division. The 25th Infantry Division was established on October 1st, 1941 as uh, formerly known as the Hawaiian Division. The division had been split into two different types of units, the 24th Infantry Division as well as the 25th Infantry Division. We cover a wide variety of history of the 25th Infantry Division from its initial fighting in Guadalcanal in World War II through Korea and into the Vietnam period and also up until today where we talk about how the Tropic Lightning Division is established as a light fighter force. In other words, they are able to be rapidly deployed to any point in the world within 18 hours. Aloha and welcome to Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. My name is Lieutenant Brian Miles. Today, Schofield Barracks is a well-maintained and self-contained Army community. Now today, the mission of the 25th Infantry Division in U.S. Army, Hawaii, is to ensure combat readiness and to improve the well-being for the Army in Hawaii. The Army in Hawaii is a trained and ready force on point for the nation in the Pacific with committed members of our local communities. We're effective partners throughout the state and we're also guardians of Hawaii's resources. Our supported population for the 25th Infantry Division Light in U.S. Army Hawaii includes approximately 15,000 active Army personnel, 28,000 family members of those active duty personnel, 6,700 retirees, 10,200 family members of retirees, and over 7,000 Department of the Army civilians. This population totals about 67,000 people. Hi, I'm Chief Master Sergeant Bob Davis, Senior Enlisted Historian for the Pacific Air Forces in the 15th Air Base Wing here at Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. As most people are well aware, Hickam was the site of the 7 December 1941 attack by the Japanese that introduced the America into World War II. A lot has happened at the base since then. It's changed a lot. It's grown. Over the years, we've been a number of things. Throughout the war and throughout the years, we've remained one solid thing, and that's being an in-route infrastructure base for everything going into and out of the Western Pacific. Throughout the 1950s, Hickam became a military air transport service base, or MATS, where the top man on base was Navy. Then later, in 1954, when the Pacific Air Forces came in as Far East Air Forces and then became PACAP, once again it returned to total Air Force fold, and it's been an Air Force base ever since. Today it's the home of the 15th Air Base Wing, which operates the infrastructure to handle everything going in and out of the Pacific. Throughout uh, the years, we've done things such as supporting the space flight operations. To, uh, we brought uh, Gemini 8 in here after the astronauts landed. We've done a number of those kind of operations. And we also were the site of Operation Homecoming, which brought home the POWs from Vietnam in 1973. So as you can see, the base has been and continues to be very important to the United States Air Force. 
Historic Fort Shafter, headquarters for the U.S. Army Pacific. This is Palm Circle. General Short lived here at Fort Shafter. Fort Shafter did have casualties on December 7th. This baseball field is dedicated to Corporal Favreau, a fountain built by Italian internees. The U.S. Army Museum of Hawaii at Fort DeRussi. The museum is located near Waikiki and occupies Battery Randolph, a coast artillery fort. Pieces of crashed Japanese planes used in the attack on Pearl Harbor are on display here at the museum. The museum is a host to numerous weapons, from early Hawaiian to present day weaponry. The museum has many artifacts on display. The museum also shows you how it functioned as a coastal artillery fort. Outside you will find a gun emplacement. The Army Museum at Fort DeRussi. December 7, 1941. A date forever etched into American history. We cannot forget what happened on December 7th or the people involved in the attack. They are real American heroes. Pearl Harbor, the real story.